David Holman, yeah. who I saw at the conference as well. He gave a great talk, so if you missed this talk, you can watch that one. All right, I, I have been greatly looking it's forward great. to like having a lot of time to like go through the slides slowly and taking <laughs> them all apart, and now I might have to go through them like even faster than I've ever done before. But uh, I'll skip. Everyone want to? Anyone want to leave early, or we just slow well, we it down? And we'll just extend the yeah. time. Well, it all depends on whether they throw us out of the room or not. Okay. Maybe I just take my time and we get as far as we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. So far, they didn't. And we can resist. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 All right, um, so this talk is going to be about asynchronous programming, of course, and about the C++ standardizations committee uh, and their search for some sort of like base uh, asynchronous abstraction that's going to make it possible for us to do for asynchronous programming what Alex Stepanov did in the STL. It's like find the core abstraction that makes it possible to write generic algorithms um, that are reusable uh, and um, that can work in many different execution contexts, like for instance, uh, Red Pool or the GPU or this various heterogeneous computing or parallel runtimes that you might be familiar with. So these abstractions, they need to be composable and they need a, a very low abstraction over there because this is C++ and not Haskell. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And it should work really well with code routines because code routines are going to be a language feature that's um, new in C20. I'm curious, has anybody here played with code routines yet? Microsoft compiler has them, has had them for a long time, Clang has them. Nobody. Okay. Well then um, good stuff for you to come. Um, fibers and threads also. Uh, fibers are non-standard, but there's talk about standardizing fibers also. Um, Right, and so it's, um, ideally, it should work with concurrency and parallelism. And I'll talk a little bit about what the difference between those things are. Uh, when I gave this talk last, a few weeks ago, I had this disclaimer, the talk does not represent the official views of WG21. But we can get rid of that, and it does now actually <laughs> represent the official views of WG21, because we, um, uh, at our most recent committee meeting presented these ideas. These ideas are now incorporated into the official uh, asynchronous um, proposal. And uh, as a whole, the committee gave a thumbs up on the overall direction. So this is now um, um, on a standard track. Doesn't mean it's going to be standard, but it's on a standard track. OK, my second disclaimer is that this talk makes use of C-style casts. <laughs> OK. Um, I was going to run through a description of the difference between concurrent uh, um, parallelism and concurrency. Um, and I can give this really quick um, and then skip a lot of the other um, slides, which is largely background material. So if you've done multi-threaded programming, um, chances are good you've been doing concurrency. Here, okay? Concurrency is you have all these uh, tasks. They are all running. Um, Currently, but there might be some dependencies between the tasks, meaning they might, uh, one thread is acquiring a mutex and holding a lock while the other thread is, is you know, waiting on that. So there's uh, maybe there's um, atomic operations that are synchronizing between these, these tasks. So concurrency is there's some sort of dependencies um, that are not apparent to the runtime system, they're only apparent to the program. Uh, in parallelism, you have these um, multiple tasks, and they can operate entirely independently. They have no dependencies on, uh, between them whatsoever. So that's the difference between parallelism and concurrency. In parallelism, think um, GPU. Think uh, SSE instructions, think SIM, that sort of thing. The nice thing about parallelism is that the scheduler Know, whatever is you know whatever your parallel execution environment is, can choose how it wants to schedule operations. Because there's no dependencies, order doesn't matter. It can order everything entirely serially if it wants to, and that is a correct program ordering. You're not going to introduce deadlocks by doing this. So that's a nice thing about 
parallelism, that the scheduler has complete and total freedom about how to schedule. Concurrency, on the other hand, your scheduler is really constrained because it doesn't know what the dependencies are. It can't make any assumptions. And so if it tried to run things uh, entire, entirely in serial, chances are good you're not going to be able to make forward progress because there's some sort of cross-task dependency. So stick a pin in that. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides. And then we're going to come back to this idea of the difference between parallelism and concurrency a little bit later in the talk. OK. I do want to say something about this one. So in C17, we got a whole bunch of parallel algorithms. All the um, STL algorithms that you're already familiar with now have parallel variants. Um, for large data sets, they're a lot faster. Why? Um, because in calling a parallel algorithm, you are communicating to the runtime, this function that I am passing you and this data that I'm passing you, you can execute all that stuff in parallel without dependencies, do something intelligent and go. Okay. So you are providing to the uh, runtime information about the task graph before you execute the task graph. And that way the, the runtime can make intelligent decisions. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about this core abstraction that the committee is uh, developing. And in order to describe what senders and receivers are, I'm first going to talk about something that's a little bit more familiar, maybe. Standard futures. Has anybody used stood future? Like, okay, like about half the room. Great. Has anybody used like a variant of future, like maybe from Boost? Boost future? Uh, no Boost future users? A self-made future? Okay. Did that self-made future uh, let you chain continuations? No. It did not. Okay, so nobody here has used a future that lets you attach a continuation. That's really interesting because that's where concurrency gets um, powerful. That's where um, concurrency gets composable. Okay. The task parallel library dot net does that. Okay. Yeah. So the task parallel library lets you attach continuations? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about futures that let you attach, attach continuations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why, um, as a fundamental abstraction, uh, that's problematic. Why are futures slow? Let's write a really stupid algorithm. Uh, <coughs> concurrency, presenta uh, presentations about concurrency and as asynchronous algorithms are kind of tricky because uh, no interesting asynchronous problem really fits on a slide. So you'll forgive me for having like really contrived examples here. Um, so here's an asynchronous algorithm that returns a future of an int. It's basically returning something, a handle to an int that will materialize when this algorithm completes asynchronous. In order to get a future, first you create a promise. A promise of an integer. From that, you get a future. Now you spin up a thread, and you move the promise into that thread. And then it's going to do some computation. That's, imagine that's a very complicated computation. And then you call p.setValue, the answer. So this thread has computed the result. It's going to stuff the result into the promise. And that's in one thread of execution. That's a different thread of execution than this caller, the, the calling function. So then you detach that thread, and you return the future to the caller. The caller then gets the future, and what is it going to do? It can hold on to the future for a while. It can do some other work. And then when it's done with that other work, it can say, hey, uh, future, give me the result of that work. And that would be a blocking operation, and it would block until that integer is ready. <coughs> Okay. So there's concurrency happening here. Okay? You might use it like this. You know, there'd be some calling code. Say, okay, call this algorithm, get a future to an integer. I might attach a continuation then, say future dot then. When this work completes, do the stuff in this lambda. Okay? And you can attach that continuation and Attaching the continuation is non-blocking. So I just say, when you're done, do this. And that's going to return another future. And then 
means to him to say, okay, now I'm ready for the result. Give it to me. Get the result. And this call is going to block until the uh, result is ready. And then you're going to print the result. Okay? This is how uh, promises and futures work that support continuations. Okay? Nothing um, too new or exciting about this. But um, there's something inherent in this model that um, makes futures and promises slow. But let's look what's happening under the cover. <clears throat> a future and a promise are two ends of a communication chain. Values go in here, they come out there. Okay. And they go in and they communicate across um, concurrent uh, processes, concurrent threads. In order to do that, that synchronization and that communication, you need a shared state. So there's going to be a promise in the future, and they're both going to be referencing the same shared state. And there's going to be a ref count because there's two things holding this, this thing in memory. Okay. So already, we know it's a heavy, alloc uh, heavy abstraction because here's an allocation right? that has to live someplace uh, where uh, it's going to be available no matter what. Okay. So, okay, there's going to be an allocation there, a reference count that's interlocked. Uh, operations, that synchronization. Um, and we're going to have to set a value, and we're also going to be setting a continuation. And those two things can happen at the same time, right? There's a risk that these two concurrent operations can both mutate the same shared state. So you need synchronization. So that's why we have this mutex in that condition variable. So already we have uh, synchronization, we've got allocation, interlocked operations. This is a heavy abstraction, but it's even worse than that. Because at the time you create this shared state, that is way up there when you create the promise future pair, you don't know the type of the continuation that the user is going to attach to this thing. Right? So that's like this thing. You need to declare a field uh, before you know the type of the thing you're going to stick in it. Has anybody used anything like std future? Uh, std uh, function, right? It's basically a std function. Right? So it's type erasure. What's slow about type erasure? An, an extra allocation and there's an indirection. You have to make an indirect function call. It's like a virtual. Okay? So one, probably two allocations, interlocked operations, synchronization, uh, indirect function calls. This is slow out the yin yang. Really heavyweight abstraction. Whew. All right. How successful would the STL be if all out, uh, iterators did allocation, synchronization, and type erasure? <laughs> right? Like, we wouldn't even be talking about it. <laughs> Nobody would use it. So, like, we don't want to be using promises and futures to build our fundamental abstractions. Like, promises and futures might be a, a handy, high-level utility to have. But if we're talking about, like, what is the fundamental abstraction that's going to let us build algorithms, then we shouldn't be talking about promises and futures. It's just too slow. We'll make a simple observation about this code. All right, you call this algorithm, you get a future, then you immediately attach a continuation to it. This is a really common pattern. Like, you already know the continuation before, even before you call this algorithm. Okay. So why not just pass the continuation in? Just make that continuation an argument to your asynchronous. Okay. So what happens if you do that? We change the algorithm so that it takes the continuation. And now, we capture the continuation in our lambda. And then before we set the value on the promise, we send our result through the continuation. Now, what have we done? So we know there's no longer a race on setting the continuation field. 
you don't have two concurrent processes that are going to try to access the same continuation here, right? Because the thread hasn't even started yet. Right? You already know the continuation before you launch the thread, so there's no race. So you remove the need for that synchronization. <clears throat> Great. Questions about that? That's a really important observation. So something that's a little less simple than that. So passing in a continuation avoids some synchronization overhead because it removes the race on reading and writing and continuation. achieve the same result by starting async work suspended and letting the caller add the continuation and then launching the work when they're ready to. So what is that? Okay. So let's change this code to defer the thread launch. How do we do that? Well, rather than actually doing the work eagerly and launching the thread, we return a lambda that will launch the thread. So you've completely deferred your work. You return a lambda, and the lambda takes the promise as an argument. That's the continuation. You think of this thing that you're returning as kind of like a lazy feature. It's just a lambda that takes a promise-like thing. And you'll notice here that you know since we've returned a lambda, lambda doesn't have a dot then member function, so we've changed it. We have a then function. I haven't shown you what then as a function is. Uh, excuse me, a yes. question. Yeah. In the upper code fragment, I have an impression that after return, there is a T detach. Is that right? T detach follows the return statement? So, yeah. It detaches inside so of lambda. What you're returning is a lambda. So, you return <coughs> bracket bracket. Okay, so what you're returning is a lambda, and the lambda ends here. That's the return state. So you're creating a thread. Run, run, run your internal brace matching algorithm, right? I hope the braces match on this slide. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. One. Uh -huh. Okay. This, it's the assignment. This, this is assignment. the brace that matches this one. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. This point. It's right. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes. How do you specify this uh, the return type of this function if you have a header and an implementation? Right. How, so, how do you do that? Because you can use auto because you have the implementation here. If you don't, then what do you have to do there? Right. So um, you would need to uh, write a. Um, you probably couldn't use a lambda. Okay. What you would do is you would write a. Um, a class type that behaves like a lambda. Okay. Just a function. Got uh, it. A function object. And then, then use different type there. No, and then you would you okay. return the, the, the class, class type, type, right? Because you'd be returning a class that has a function call operator on it. Got it. And really, a lambda is just a class that has a function call operator. Just one that the gen compiler generates. Okay. And you'll notice that when you call async algorithm and you get back a lambda, no work has been done. All you've done is created a lambda. Okay. So then it's just an algorithm. It's an algorithm that takes one of these lazy futures, and a lambda, and a function continuation. And it's going to return another lazy future. It's going to return another lambda. A lambda that takes a promise as an argument. Okay. So you're going to return this lambda, and the last thing the lambda is going to do is 
invoke this function, right? launch that lazy future, get it to start executing. And you know that since it's a lazy future, the thing that you pass here has to be a, a promise-like thing, something that satisfies the promise interface, that it has a set value. It also has a set exception, because that's what promises do. You have a set value and set exception, in case there's an error. Okay, so let's, let's gin up a promise. So a promise has these two methods, set value and set exception. You know, but what happens in here? What happens is that you, you capture the promise that gets passed into this lambda. You capture the continuation function. And then in your set value, you take the values, you pass them to the continuation function. You take the result of that, and you set that value on the promise. So just like on the last slide, where we passed the continuation in, called the continuation, and then set the uh, value with the result of that evaluation, right? the same thing that's happening here. Okay. Now we construct an object of that promise type, and we use that as the promise to the outer task. So what we've done is we've encoded the logic of the then algorithm in this ginned up promise type and passed that in. In um, functional programming languages, this is something known as uh, continuation passing stuff. That is, rather than an algorithm computing its result and returning it to the sender, to the caller, an algorithm computes its result and passes it into a continuation. And you parameterize algorithms by passing continuations into, their al into that algorithm. So the then algorithm, which is now just a generic algorithm that operates on any lazy future, operates on a lazy future and takes a continuation function and hooks these two things up, plugs them together, and causes the continuation to run after the task completes. And you can keep adding these continuations. You can chain as many operations as you would like. And so, no work is getting done here. You're just creating a lambda. No work is getting done here. You're just creating a more complicated lambda. And so nothing has happened yet. <coughs> okay. Yes. So here, I call async algorithm. I get back a lambda. Right. You can think of this as a lazy future. You can think of it as a task. Right? A task is my, another word for a lazy future. You take that task, and you pass it in as the first argument to then. And what you're saying is, like, when this task finishes, do this other function on the result of that task. Hook these two things together. That's the task. So it's just a function. So f in this code is this task that gets executed here as the last step in this lambda when it gets executed. <laughs> yes? Is then kind of like a chain thing? A chain. Why yes. is it not called chain or how is it different from chain? The reason why I called it then is because the operation in um, there's precedence in the C++ language for calling this operation then. You could also think of it as transform. You could think of it as map. If you're from functional programming languages, right, you're taking a value and you're mapping another function over it, right? That's, this okay. is the basic operation. You have, you have a value in this case, it's like a lazy value, a value that will materialize later. 
and you want to apply a function to the result of that. Right? So you could call this map, you could call it transform. Um, in uh, the boost futures library, the operation is called then, so I call it then. Do this, then that. Correct. But is this really, I mean, this is like C sharp where they have the lambda functions and they put a list through another list through another list. Mm -hmm. How is this really dealing with the asynchronous problem? Versus, we'll get to that. Yes. Versus, I mean, we're just talking about adding another function to an yeah. existing function. Yeah, it doesn't sound like we're dealing with the asynchronous problem. We haven't got to async yet. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, but that's a good question. Stay tuned. Okay. 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 So then, like, great, I've composed this really complicated lambda, but like, what do I do now with this thing? Well, somehow, I mean, you have to do ultimately what you always do with a lambda, which is you have to call it, right? So you call it with something. So maybe I, maybe I chain another operation on it that's going to print the result, okay? And then maybe I call this thing and finally make something happen. And I pass in some promise-like thing that, you know, let's just call it sync. And sync is just really dumb. It's going to ignore any values and terminate on exceptions. Okay. So what happens now? What does this do? Well, what's going to happen is a number of things. Um, mostly they're not good. First off, you're doing the printf in the wrong thread. The printf is happening in a this thread context, whereas what we wanted was it to be called from main. That was the original code. Right? So kind of bad, but what's worse is that main no longer blocks. So what's happening here is you launch this thread, you run off and do some computation, and then you run these lambdas in sequence, but main isn't blocking. Main is just exiting. Peace out, my work here is done, right? And now you've run off the end of main, the program terminates, you still have another thread running, you're now an undefined behavior runner. Okay, so that's not good. So we need to find some way of introducing blocking back into this. Well, great, blocking is just an algorithm too. So let's write a blocking algorithm. Let's call it sync weight. Sync weight is going to take one of these lambdas, a task, and it's going to define some state. And that state is going to live on the program stack. Now, this isn't state that needs to be dynamically allocated, but like the promises and features. And you'll create a promise that holds a reference to that state, and you're going to launch the operation. So the first thing sync weight is going to do is it's going to say, okay, here's my continuation, now go. So what's in the state? Well, our mutex, our condition variable, and the variant. The mutex and the condition variable are obviously for synchronization. And the variant, remember, the promise has set value and it has set exception. So an asynchronous computation can either complete successfully with a value, or it can error with an exception. So we need a variant to hold either the value or the exception. So that ultimately, in sync weight, we will get either a value or an exception and take appropriate action. Yes? What's mono state? The worst named thing in the standard library ever. <laughs> yeah, mono state means uh, empty. Uh, there's, there's no value there. So the, the variant. Yeah, I know, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the variant in when you first create it is holding neither a value nor an exception. So it needs some way of representing emptiness. So that's that's this. Uninitialized. Right. What's that? Basically uninitialized. Uninitialized, yeah, except variant doesn't have a notion of uninitialized. If you have variant A, B, you're holding either an A or a B. Mm -hmm. So. If you're holding neither an A nor a B, then you need to be holding something else. And you just hold an instance of monostate. You can think of it as void. 
Better than unique putter. What's that? Better than holding a unique putter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was in the room when they picked that name. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome one. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so that's the state. Our promise just holds a pointer to that state, and it has set value and it can set exception. And what set value and set exception does is it um, in places <coughs> into the correct slot in your variant. You're either setting the T or you're setting the exception. But of course, first you need to take a lock, and then you notify on the condition. Because right, this could be happening concurrently. There's another thread of execution. Now you just wait for it to finish. You grab a lock, you wait on the condition variable until you're no longer holding mono state. Right? I now know I have either a value or an error. If you have an exception, rethrow the exception. Otherwise, return the value. Unless the value is mono state. It's not mono state. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be mono state. Right? Yeah. You don't get past the condition right. variable if, if you still have um, slot number zero filled in your variant. You just keep retrying until you get something that isn't zero. I was thinking if the person who was chaining before you returned you a model state. Well, and that, then, it, then it would go, if you were expecting the, uh, the result of your asynchronous computation to return a mono state. Then it would be here and not here, mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay. you'd, you'd be filling slot number two in your variable. <coughs> so your index would be two as opposed to zero, right? So index would be two, that doesn't equal zero, great. So if, slot, if it's slot number one, then it's an error, throw the exception. Otherwise, mm -hmm. get the value and return. All right, so we just implemented future.get as a generic algorithm over lazy futures. That's pretty cool. Yes? Questions? And lots of code. Lots of code. But it's code that fits on a slide. <laughs> You're going to tell us there's a way of getting rid of all the boilerplate, right? What's that? We can get rid of all the boilerplate later, right? It's all in the standard library, right? You don't have okay. to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's look again at our, our main function. So this is what we had before, and it was totally broken. So we can fix it like this, right? We create an asynchronous operation. We chain work on it. Then we <coughs> run it, and we print it. But there's a way I'd like to refactor this code because, in a sense, it's, it's doing more, this algorithm is doing more than it really should. Like, why is thread creation the responsibility of this asynchronous algorithm? Maybe I, the caller of asynchronous algorithm, don't want it to be creating a thread. Maybe I want it to run on a, a thread pool. Okay, let's move that thing out. Let's create a function called new thread that returns all of these lazy futures. That function's only responsibility is to create a new thread and then immediately complete in that new context, in that new thread. Set value on the promise. Let me detach it. Why do we never ever detach a thread? It's always a bug. But anyway, this is slide code. Okay, so now we have this new thread function, which creates a lazy future that just creates a thread. And now we change our asynchronous algorithm to be parameterized by a task. Think of this as like a predecessor operation. I want you to do this asynchronous algorithm, but I want you to do this other thing first. So what we do is we use then to chain our computation 
after the predecessor. Right? And these two things fit together quite nicely because I can say new thread and pass it to asynchronous algorithm. Now what I'm doing is I create a new thread that immediately completes calls set value on the promise, which is going to cause this lambda to execute, which means that this computation is going to be running in the context of the new thread that was created over here. All right, are folks starting to see how you can program in this model? No? Oh. <laughs> Did that just break your brain? <laughs> Alright. Okay. So new thread is, is what I call an executor. New thread is, is an example of um, a lazy future whose sole responsibility is to create some new execution context in which other work can execute. So this is what I've been trying to convince the committee of. That executors are really these very simple things. Right? It's just, an executor is just an instance of a lazy future. And that really what we should be talking about are lazy futures. That that's where the interesting bit is. The simplest program which does nothing, you create a new thread and then call simulate on it. Yeah. And it would do nothing. It would, it, would, it would create a thread and then immediately block until, yeah. So yeah. this is very similar to creating a list. There is a nil, right? Yes. And like an empty yeah. list that terminated. So your new thread actually creates this terminator. Mm -hmm. And then you can't continuations to it, right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. You executed back this is mm -hmm. on the tape. Yeah. <clears throat> Alright. That's really the meat of it. Now if we get thrown out of the room, I've kind of communicated like the bulk of what I wanted to, to say. Um. Alright, so what have we achieved? Lazy futures have a lot of advantages over eager futures. Notice we did all of that composition without any dynamic allocation, without synchronization, and without typeation. That's pretty cool. And we can compose these things just as a generic algorithm. We can block as a generic algorithm. In fact, there's all kinds of generic algorithms that we could write. Um, that just use this promise future like interface. Um, we could write a when all or a when any or any of those other algorithms that you might be familiar with from other um, runtimes. Uh, you could write all of those as generic algorithms in terms of these lazy futures and lazy promises. And we get to encapsulate executors and execution contexts as just a special case of one of these. Okay. Has anybody used concepts? Nobody's used like the C++ 20 concepts language. Has anybody talked? Like, I'm curious. Has Has MWCPP gotten a concepts talk yet? No, we have not. Yes, you have. I've seen it. I've seen it. You've seen it. Oh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Okay. So I'll probably skip these slides, which are like build out the um, sender-receiver concepts. So basically, um, a lazy future is a sender, and a receiver is a promise. That's basically it. You can think of a promise as a kind of a continuation. Right. So a, a promise, which has set value and set exception, you can kind of think of set value as a function call. This is just like, a function that you pass in, you say, I, I want to do the rest, you do this after you've finished that. So I have one question. Yeah. How, uh, 
if your main thread wants to cancel, like if it's a terminate or something, how, yes. how does that work? Oh, cancellation is very interesting. We'll get to that. Okay. okay. So, in fact, I'm going to get to that real soon. So set value and set exception and set done. Set done is what gets called when there is cancellation. So in, um, in lazy, it, once you introduce asynchrony, you introduce the, the desire for cancellation. And cancellation needs to be baked into your um, concepts from the file. Otherwise, you can never add on cancellation. Um, yeah, question? This is kind of a dumb question, but um, can I still use boost threads so that I can abort a thread? Is, is it now you can actually cancel in the middle of your job or cancel your thread as it's running in STD or is it still like not? So like aborting as yeah. in like like I'm just going to whack this The interrupt this or thread. whatever, right. That um, boost has it. So that is um, considered kind of impolite yeah. to, to just whack a running process because you're probably going to um, uh, invalidate your, your program's um, invariance. Uh, what we are thinking of now is that um, it's going to be a cooperative cancellation. Uh, that um, someone who is holding on, so one task can uh, request another task to stop. Right, that's what Boost does, right? Yeah, like so, you, so, right. yeah. so you'll signal on what's called a stop token, and this is a new library feature that's coming in C20. Mm -hmm. Say request, request stop. And then this other task is going to be periodically polling this stop token, like, did somebody request a stop? If so, call set done on my continuation and bit. Okay. Notify downstream operations that, you know, you're expecting a value or an error. Well, you're not going to get either because someone's canceled. So why not just use an exception for that? Because we can have a whole long conversation about why not using an exception. Um, basically, um, cancellation has some similarities with uh, exceptions, and it also has some similarities with um, um, success. Uh, philosophically, you can think of um, cancellation as um, this process has already succeeded, so please stop working. Right? Uh, so in that sense, it um, it isn't an error. Um, so you don't want to handle it like errors because then you're going to be mixing in cancellation logic with your error handling logic, and you can make all kinds of errors when you do that. But still, it's just like another path other than getting set value called, right? It's just another path. That's why we have three separate channels for it. It's just another channel. But we, we think these are the three fundamental ones. Yeah. Yeah. So you're thinking this as a nullable Boolean? True, false, and null? Is that a way of thinking it's, about it? It's kind of tri-state-ish. Right, tri yeah. state nullable Boolean. Yeah. Um, second part is, the cost-wise, is there a difference in exception path's cost? Because you have to unwind the exception? Or is that how does that differ, or is that the same here? Um, you can kind of think of... Uh, cancellation as an unwind, just like exceptions. Um, you'll have to run certain cleanup actions um, on the cancellation path, but just like you would on the exceptional path. Mm -hmm. uh, the only the difference is there are um, think of there are some generic algorithms that that really want to tell the difference between cancellation and error. So think of a, an error a, a generic algorithm like retry. You're going to retry on errors, but if, if the user requests cancellation, you don't want to retry that. Yeah. So you don't want to get those two signals conflated. Yeah. So a uh, class usually has, by default, a constructor, destructor. Is it going to now have, by default, for asynchronous, set value, set exception, and set done? Uh, so the question is, like, how this... Um, plays, how this interacts with the object model. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't, but when we come to coroutines, the um, things get kind of interesting. Uh, so 
we we think that there should probably be like something like asynchronous finalization for an object. The C++ doesn't have this. It's not getting it in C++ 20. But there, there probably needs to be something like this. Um, an operation that, um, an asynchronous operation, a non-blocking asynchronous operation that does clean up. Synchronous destructor? Something like an asynchronous destructor, but you can't really make destructors asynchronous because it screws up everything. Mm -hmm. The language semantics just don't, are, are hostile. It's one of the things that are hostile to. <laughs> you end up bifurcating the entire type system once you move it. Mm -hmm. All right. OK, so let's call this thing a receiver. Let's factor it out. So a receiver is something that has said, done, and said error. And then you can say a receiver of int is something that uh, you know you're going to be passing an integer into. So this is this is the terminology that we uh, have settled on. This is um, C plus plus twenty syntax for defining concepts. <coughs> I mean, I've been I've been breathing this stuff for a couple of years now, so it doesn't look strange to me, but it might look strange to you guys. I don't know if you can tell what's going on here. So more or less, so we think of a void task. It would be just a receiver. A void? Uh, a task that just doesn't, the free to free yes. task. So, voices that doesn't. Right, so if it took no values, yeah. right? So imagine V's is, a, is an empty pack. This is a parameter yeah. pack. Mm -hmm. V's is an empty pack. So set value that takes no arguments. Mm -hmm. it, it has to have set value. Okay. But it would take set value that takes no arguments. Mm -hmm. And we saw an example of that. The um, uh, new task. New, sorry, new thread. <coughs> Let me back up. I'll show you a new thread. You see? Set value with no arguments, mm -hmm. right? So you can kind of think of um, new thread as returning a uh, future of void, mm -hmm. and it's expecting a promise of void. Mm -hmm. This is no arguments. So does that allow for type uh, or extension? So that if I say before, you know, integer to string, now we can say integer dot something <coughs> task. Um, it would be a, a tap. Well, a task is always returning some values. It produces some values. So if uh, if you have a task that returns an integer. You can chain it with something that converts that integer to a string, but then you have a task of string. Okay. Does that make sense? But that allows for extension of the string class or something. We can add more functionality to the string class. I don't. I don't think I follow. You mean concepts? Um. I'm. I'm basing it on like C sharp syntax where you it's have not, not extension methods. Okay, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> and so what we've been calling a, a lazy future is just something that's like callable with a with a receiver. Um, we think we're going to call that sender, and rather than using function call, that is uh, rather than uh, calling lamb, we're calling them lambdas. Um, there's going to be a submit operation. We give the we give the um, the operation a name. So a submit function, which is going to take a sender and a receiver. Same thing, just different syntax. Uh, okay. So how does this play with coroutines? Coroutines are kind of a, um, whether a C++ 20 feature that's coming that's going to make asynchronous programming a lot like synchronous programming. Has any, anybody played with coroutines yet? No, I've already asked that. The answer is no. Um, so here's an example of a coroutine. So imagine there's some coroutine task type, um, and this is like a task of void. So if you have some helper 
that returns a coroutine type. You can co-await it. That is, like, I am going to suspend the execution of this function until this result is ready. When that result is ready, I am going to resume this function, continue executing this function. So coroutines are kind of a, an extension of the concept of function, right? In C++, as we've known it, there's only so many things you can do with functions. You can call them, and you can return from them. With coroutines, you can call them, you can suspend them, you can resume them, and you can return them. And this makes it really nice to do asynchronous programming. What the compiler is actually going to do is it's going to carve your function up into a whole bunch of other little functions. Because everything after a co-await is a callback. So this thing gets ripped off, becomes its own function, and then it's going to, that function is going to get scheduled for execution uh, when, when this result is ready. Scheduled where, resumed where, how, right? That all gets determined by the library type. With coroutines, uh, all of that power is put in the hands of the library writer. If you write a coroutine uh, return type, you get to say how things get scheduled and how things get resumed. But fundamentally, the compiler does the heavy lifting for you it takes your function, the coroutine function, and turns it into essentially a state machine by ripping it up and giving you all of these pieces that you can then schedule however you want. That's kind of handy. But there you go. This is implicitly a call. When does the function become a coroutine? If it contains all the way? Yes, if it contains one of the coroutine tables. Who is actually going to perform this function? I think that it be a new thread executed by internally? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Like, is it going to get scheduled on a thread? Is it going to get scheduled in a thread pool? Is it going to, like, we're C++ programmers, we care about, like, where work happens. So that's why the coroutine, the C++, well, the C++ coroutines language feature, like, puts it in the control of the library author. So whoever wrote this type, the task type, will get to say how this scheduling happens. What we would like to do, the committee, is we would like to make it possible for uh, users to control how asynchronous work is done and where. So remember I talked about like this notion of an executor? Okay. We want to be able to use that notion with coroutines too. We want that abstraction to work really well in this space. Okay. So, you remember how I talked a little bit about how promises were like... So, this is lazy thing, this coroutine. Coroutines are usually lazy. Yes. The funny thing so, about... So, you, you, so, you so, combine it with, like, new thread, and then do the coroutine? You're jumping ahead. Oh. <laughs> so most coroutine types, you can, there is a, a hidden co-weight right at the start of every coroutine function. So there, uh, you call a coroutine, and you get back a handle, no work gets done. That should sound familiar. Okay. Yes? So for the co-weight, mm -hmm. I think about that sort of as a call to the then function with result and the dotted section there. So what like that? Yeah, so so you stole my you stole like my my thunder, right? <laughs> this is when the coroutine is, is like a callback, and if callbacks are receivers, then coroutines are receivers and the waitables are senders. Bad zone. Bad. Well what? <laughs> Jumping ahead. So like there there's like a direct correspondence, a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between this language feature, coroutines, and the uh, sender-receiver abstraction. These lazy features. Yeah. Um, so is that the same with the uh, await and await keyword in JavaScript? I am not super familiar with the await 
keyword in JavaScript. Um, C++ code routines are kind of a strange beast. Um, I think the fact that they uh, put the control of scheduling in the hands of the library developers is a rather unique feature of uh, C++ code routines. Um, this, do you know? I thought you were raising your hand. No, I'm just, you just keep saying library developers. You're talking about Boost and STL. You're talking about I can write as my own my own task that has my own. You can write your own program. task oh. that that does all of this stuff. It's exceedingly painful. The um, yeah, there's not a lot of abstraction there, but um, but yeah, I mean you could write your own your own type. There are blog posts online uh, that show you how to do it. But isn't that the right trade-off? Given you want to uh, give the power to the, the library author, like application developer. Absolutely, right. In in C++, we definitely want to give the programmers control over how work uh, is done. In work. It does have a lot of um, similarities to uh, what they're doing now in Rust. In the Rust programming language, they are just getting um, support for uh, something like coroutines. And they are going to be returning lazy futures. Futures that uh, are handles to work that hasn't been scheduled yet and won't be scheduled until you await it. So just purely by chance, or, or maybe you know, just convergent evolution, um, C++, and COVID, uh, C++ and Rust are going to be getting almost exactly the same um, system for async. Yes, I think that's how a sync and, uh, sync and await work in C Sharp, just like you described. That's how those things have been working there. Okay, so, so nothing happens until you await them? I mean, They're lazy? So, yes. okay. Yeah, they return a task up, task something. Yeah. Like you do task yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So what do I mean when I say, like, awaitables are senders and senders are awaitables? I mean, we can actually define a... Um, in the standard library, I hope, at some point, there is this global operator co-await that can turn any sender into something that you can co-await to get its result in a code routine. I'm not going to show the implementation. This implementation will not fit on the slide. <laughs> but you can write this function, and that's really cool. So anything that's, that satisfies that sender concept. Anything with that submit function that takes a receiver, you can make it co-awaitable in a concept, in a code routine. Now let's get this example. Okay. Now let's get that example too. Okay. Likewise, you can go the other way. Anything that you can co-await in a code routine you can adapt into being a sender. That is, you can give it a submit operation so that users can attach continuations to it explicitly. Okay. And what you do is you create a lambda that is a coroutine. You co-await that thing, and then you, oh, that should be set value. This should be a call to set value. This is a bug on this thing. Okay. So this is a receiver. The receiver has a set value member function on it. Right? So you co-await this awaitable in the code routine. You get a result. You pass it to the set value. Okay? If there's an exception, you set the error instead. So in this way, anything that is an awaitable you can make it into a sender. And users can create their own receivers and get the result of that um, asynchronous operation that way. So the point I'm trying to make here is that senders and awaitables can be adapted into each other. Programmatic. They have the same expressive power. And they express the same fundamental abstraction. So is this where your C-style cast comes in? Oh, yes, yeah, so the C-style cast is all over the place. Yeah, all over the place. Yeah. So why are they required? Um, why are they required? Uh, yeah, um, in a lot of cases, um, you, um, 
you get better performance if you can move things instead of copy them. So this is um, you know, basically like a call to std move or std forward. Um, but can't you just do by a static cast? You can do it with a static cast too. Yeah, I mean, it takes more characters, and I run out of room on the slide. Yeah. So that. Yeah. So uh, from, basically, std move is nothing that, but a static cast. Static cast. Yeah. From a from a performance perspective, you want to use universal references, which is what you're doing everywhere. That, yes. That's that's the point you're making. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Cast mm -hmm. static cast. All right. So I could go on and I could show how to build more stuff on top of senders receivers. The examples that I have next are, um, you know, if you have nothing but senders and receivers, these lazy promises and futures, you can build eager promises and futures, like std future, on top of them. And I could run through that example if you guys are interested. Um, but it's getting pretty late. So I don't know, are you guys interested in hearing more? Or do you want to like break and go to the bar? Like, what do you guys want? <laughs> All right, I mean, we can pause if anyone wants to get up and go, and then the rest of you guys can stick around and hear a little bit more. So I, I, I'm wondering if, um, how, how would you compose things? Like, you, you, would, you would write something that asynchronous and opens at time. So it returns some kind of task. Yeah, so you need help from the OS. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, you need some sort of sort but of like encapsulated in sort of like you have a function open file and it returns a task which is a long Yeah, doesn't start opening the file at this point yet. Yes, okay. Now you have another one that says read file into a box. Yeah, it's also a thing. Mm -hmm. So it returns a task, it doesn't run a task that reads, mm -hmm. it takes a file and it's a file handle or a file pointer or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, how would you compose these two? Hmm? Well, one would be the first one because the task, and the second one except the file handle. The file handle sits in the task, right? Right. So, so you would have a uh, a task of a file handle. And you would have a function that takes a file and, trying to see it. and then you would compose them with, with the event function. You have a task of a file handle and you have a function that accepts a file. But still, you still don't well, sure do anything until you actually want to. Would you say that you need a task that returns a task of a file envelope, a task that will produce. And when I say return, I don't actually mean return, right? I mean pass forward. Continuation passes. Well, it returns it when it finally gets a chance to run. When it, when it runs, it passes it forward. Yeah. As opposed to, uh, you know, return, which, you know, it's off his range. It's off. Well, we use, uh, to mean this whole thing reminds me of the training building block that Intel launched that has tasks that are quite similar to the concept. It happens, but it's not because you did it in a certain way. Oh, this goes back. Lazy features that you're talking about are not the same. All what do you think about that? Like you said, this, this thing. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not going to put other tasks on just to do that. But they all get scheduled. Right, I mean, the TBB was like a, a, a whole <laughs> parallel runtime, and you build like graphs of, of <laughs> tasks and things, right? And these tasks are. Like just anybody that's working on the whole thing. I'm kind of not clear where the boundaries are. I don't know enough about TVB to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, they call them tasks. Sure, name. sure, sure. I mean, it's. I think we're going to end up calling them tasks as well. You know, there's going to be like a there's going to be a coroutine support library eventually, and I think just about like the most important type that you will have in that support library is going to be called task. And it will be something that is awaitable. You have know, like task int, and it will be an awaitable title. But it will also be a sender. Yeah. 
Like and you'll have generic algorithms that accept there. senders. And a task is a sender, so you can pass it. And then they can do any work they want. I could do that. Right, and a, and a weightable type is anything that you can co await to get the uh, result. Yeah. 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 So then, the continuation is just a function that takes it from A to B. Yes. And it, this I'm is saying, but, but, but like if you are attaching, you, you want to attach an algorithm that actually produces it. Produce something that takes a temp. Then you want to attach it. Like read file, read yes. file. Yeah. So you want to open a file, open a file with this path. Now you want to do then. And there may be some places where you can handle it. Mm -hmm. so it synchronously read the file. So wouldn't then produce then a task that produces this? It produces a task. Of a task of task, right? But then you can you can you can collapse those. How can you collapse? A task of a task? Uh -huh. That's a join. It's a join. It's, it's, it's a monad. Yes. Yeah. It's like your then is F at the same time as Y. It's fine. This is what the assembly language looks like. We don't do a good job. I want to talk with you more about this. There's like a confusion between then being both F-mod and Y. Yeah. 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 There has to be a distinction between sure. F naught and phi. Yeah. Unless you use F naught to get the task of scratch to make sure you do a join. Yeah. F naught join. It'd be fun to, to, to write the joint operation. operation. So, so this, all right. Yeah. I mean, this is like so a legitimate question, right? I mean, yes, it's yes, interesting yes. open a file, it's interesting read a file. How do I combine this? Yeah, right. Yeah. Would you do that? Would you have a task that has a task? So in the C-Shop, of course, it's a task. The lead operation now would be taking the task files. No, no, it takes a task. It's a task. And the system writing for them is very much more like that. And the system writing for them is very much more like that. Right. Or, well, it's not quite the easy thing to use the file. We want to prime these things. You have file handle that's not evaluated. It's not evaluated. It's not evaluated. If you want to put it then on it, but the then takes a function, but it takes a file handle, and it's a task that we have all these extra. Right, so a wave operation would be used as often as the result is going to be a proper file So why can't you add a little to that? But a wave is already a team that actually does the line after I enter a whole team. But if you That's want my understanding. Yeah. Coroutine is like a yeah. coroutine. Yeah. Coroutine is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you know, so you know you every time you say away, it will away and then produce. Oh, it's it's the what you get back is a, is a result, not a yeah. coroutine type. So you are hiding a bind inside, inside a coroutine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have a bind outside of the coroutine? I need like a library function instead of it's kind of early. Then they have both. Yeah. Uh, we'll get uh, at least another 30 minutes in if you can. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. Okay. So, so, yes. Okay. So, yes. Well, but there's one course at runtime.
Number two of it, we use the ability to cancel this uh, function or the task. So, uh, no, you don't. Um, but we, like, like with all other tasks, it needs to be cooperative. So you will need to pass in a uh, stop token and your asynchronous task, whether it is uh, sender or whether it's an awaitable, will need to be polling that stop token periodically and then take some sort of action if the user has requested cancellation. In coroutines, it's pretty ugly because we only get a value channel or an error channel. There isn't a cancellation channel. Um, so we're trying to figure out exactly what the answer is for coroutines. What does a coroutine type do when the user has requested cancellation? Um, we would like coroutines to support cancellation natively, and they won't in C++ So we might need an evolution of the coroutines language feature. Yeah? When you broke out of co wait, you said it becomes effectively a subroutine callback. Mm -hmm. Which has full subroutine call overhead, you know, the, the standard header and trailer around it? Not necessarily. So, the, yeah, the, the, my point being is that when all of this is put together, um, kind of how bad is the whole systemic overhead versus your obvious and totally understandable simple examples? you want to do a reasonable amount of work so that overhead becomes minimal. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, um, your question is about the overhead of coroutines, specifically? No, no, about standard receivers. Standard receivers. Okay. I mean, that's the end result I care right. about. Right. So a lot of the, um, what I've shown so far, uh, this is um, static function calls, right? This is all, of, uh, no type erasure, no indirect function calls. Um, your compiler optimizers, modern optimizing technology is really good at things like constant propagation, inlining, um, constant folding, uh, all of that stuff. Um, a lot of this stuff can completely optimize away. Right. Um, and for coroutines, uh, the overhead is uh, generally the coroutine frame, you know, what you think of as a stack frame, like a function activation record. Um, Rather than being on the stack, it's going to be on the heap. So there's going to be a, uh, uh, an allocation there uh, for the coroutine frame. Um, if you use, um, if the compiler can see that the frame uh, is allocated here and deallocated here, and it's within a scope, um, Clang is really good at eliminating that allocation. So it has a specific optimization pass called allocation illusion. Um, and the implementation of the coroutines language feature in Clang um, is such that it uh, often hits this optimization and you elide your allocation, which is great. But it's not something, unfortunately, that you can count on. The language semantics don't let you rely on. Um, there's also another nice feature of, of coroutines, which is like one coroutine can symmetrically, symmetrically transfer uh, execution to another coroutine. That is, I am suspending, and here is the handle to another coroutine that I want you to resume immediately. And what happens then is that the compiler turns it into a jump, and it is not a function call. There's no stack online. No stack. Yeah. Really cool. Okay. So what I've shown you so, so far is like then, which is like you change this and that and that and that. But I mean, you don't really build interesting programs like that. There's going to be branches. There's going to be loops. There's going to be actual concurrency where you uh, launch multiple things in parallel and wait for them all to finish. These are all things that you can write as generic algorithms. So things like, um, okay, we've already seen sync wait, but you could also have like wait all and wait any, things that are gonna launch multiple operations and then either wait for all of them to finish or uh, wait for any one of them to finish. Cancellation becomes really important for both of these, right? If, if you do wait any, right, the first thing that, um, first task that completes with a result, you, okay, that's your result, 
but you want to cancel all the other operations, so they stop consuming system resources. So what happens then is you're going to um, generically uh, cancel all of those other outstanding tasks, and then continue working. Okay? And you can also build promises and futures and channels and asynchronous ranges and reactive streams. All of this stuff is stuff that you can build on top of um, the basic sender receiver abstraction. So we think this is like this is like the fundamental asynchronous abstraction, like the equivalent of iterator in the world of async. The thing that lets us build asynchronous algorithms. And so let's take one example. Let's build like stood future on top of sender receiver. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. So let's build a class that's called my future. It's got a constructor that takes a sender of a T. And the first thing it's going to do, right, because the future is, is a handle to an eagerly started um, operation. So in the constructor, I need to actually get that work started. So I submit it immediately in, this, in the constructor of my future. So this thing was lazy. Now it's not. I've launched it. But at this point, I don't have a continuation yet. So I have to fake a continuation. I create a continuation for it. And I'll show you what that is. So I, I create some shared state. And I have a shared putter to that shared state. Okay. And now I make a receiver from that shared state. Okay. So here's the state. The state, this should look familiar. It has a variant. There's mono state again, uh, mutex and condition variable. And the bank receiver is going to grab a shared putter to this current state and wrap it in a receiver, something that satisfies the receiver interface. Now the get operation on this. Um, this state, this should also look familiar. Here's my condition variable wait. I wait on this condition variable after having grabbed the lock until I have something that isn't monostate again. Remember, this should all seem kind of familiar because we went through similar code. Before. All the same logic, but now we're wrapping it up in a future. Here's the receiver. This should also look familiar. Oh, this should be, this is another bug in my slide. I had a version of these slides that, where I fixed all these bugs, and now I guess I must have grabbed an old version of this presentation. My apologies. So imagine this is called set value. My apologies. So here we have set, set value, set error, and set done. And what these do is they, um, they set the appropriate field in the variant and then notify on the condition variable. So at a high level, what's happening is I have a future. I build the future from the sender. The futures constructor immediately launches that sender, causes it to start executing, submits it. By passing the receiver. The receiver has a handle to some shared state that it is using to communicate with the future. The operation starts, it's going to be turning along, sending values through the continuation chain. Eventually, it's going to reach that receiver. It's going to call one of these operations with the result of that asynchronous computation and set that value in the variant and notify on the condition. And when that condition variable gets notified, then we return from our get operation either the value or we rethrow the exception. So a future is not cancelable? This future is not cancelable. If you wanted to make it cancelable, what you would do is you would uh, take a stop token along with the sender. So you would, you would need to somehow um, pass into the future some sort of way um, for the user to communicate uh, a, a request to stop. And then you have wait ready to take that 
Well, then what you would probably end up doing is you would um, you would bundle that stock token in with the receiver, <coughs> so that all of the receivers down the line had access to the stock token, could request the stock token from the receiver, and check to see whether or not stock had been requested and take action. So is this the future that does not allow for continuation? This, this, uh... There is no continuation of the field, though? There is... Correct, there's no continuation field. This is like stood future. This future doesn't have a document. So it's, it's just as useless as, as C++'s stood future is. Yeah? To me, the unhappy thing about this notation is the use of the numbers 0, 1, and 2, or oh, whatever. <laughs> and was there any discussion about that? Of, is oh, there another way of describing that concept? Well, so so, so the, the interface to variant is a little weird. Yeah. yeah. There is an API called visit, where uh, you call uh, this visit API, you pass it a variant, and you pass it a function, basically a callback. Uh, and depending on which slot is filled, um, which value will get passed to the continuation. Uh, that way you don't have to check for, you know, is it is it this field, is it that field, get me this field, whatever. Would that be solved by pattern matching? Pattern matching. There's a proposal uh, for C++23 to, to add pattern matching to C++. That's a very good use for pattern engineers. Right now we're thinking about maybe calling it inspect or the inspect key. Mm -hmm. This is better than visitor. Mm -hmm. This is better than visitor. Yeah, visitor is awesome. <laughs> well, I, I'm just commenting about the fact that I have to make 100% sure that zero is monostate and someone doesn't come along and accidentally switch exception and T and suddenly my use of the number one is referring to the wrong guy. Absolutely. It's yeah. totally at that level and not at the concept or the yeah. or anything else. In modern languages this is solved by but, it, but you can I can replace Bartosh with a bot. You don't want to know. <laughs> the types, the types are different. You can actually put the type there. You could, you can yeah, I mean, if, if, get if, if this operation doesn't return something that you can pass to refill exception, it's not going to pop compile. I mean, it needs to be an exception. So, anyway, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, a variant is, is weird. That's not my fault. You can't really do much better in C++ without having it. Okay. So what was the point of all that? The point of that was showing that if you have lazy futures, uh, you can build eager futures on top of them. Right? And, and you can do that without adding any additional overhead besides the overhead that's inherent in uh, eagerly launching work. So, you're eagerly launching work, you're necessarily going to be doing um, allocation and synchronization. But the converse isn't true, right? You can't lazyify an eager algorithm while also taking away its overhead. Right? You don't get to do that. So, lazy operations are more fundamental than eager operations. <laughs> yes, bar touch agrees. Okay. <laughs> so uh, finally, we, we get to this point, right? So like, this is why we want um, the basis operations of our asynchronous programming to be lazy, because you don't get to remove the overhead of eager after the fact. Yeah. Why did the scanner choose to go with the eager operation? Why? Why did the committee add stood future as an eager operation? Uh, 
that's you know industry experience. That's what the that's what the whole industry was doing. Um, you could say like the programming world, um, the C plus plus programming world at least didn't know any better. What did they base it on? What language did they speak? What language did they speak? French. <laughs> well, that would be an app, right? Camel. I mean, that's a good question. I don't, I don't really know. Camel um, actually has a very good password. Um, they could have channels. Mm -hmm. So, like, buffering, um, it's a whole other interesting topic, um, which we're just starting to, like, Noodle on, like, okay, how to send a receiver and interact with buffering. The main reason to ask the question is it's good to understand why the receivers are made that way. The answer is it's just a historical artifact we didn't know better. Yeah. I think it's good for us to be able to say this is why we did it. It was a mistake as opposed to here were the reasons, and you know, we should at least think about those. Yeah. Well, well, I don't think I don't think it was understood at the time that there was something out of which you could build eager promises and futures. Okay. Um, they, they, there wasn't an appreciation of the fact that there was something more fundamental. The uh, lazy part of the of the of building this DAG, this task. Mm -hmm. uh, that's correct, yeah. That's correct. Is, is it construct? <coughs> construct? Oh, is it const expert? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, nothing that I have shown here uh, would prevent it from being evaluated at compile time, except things like thread launch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's not the, the lazy part. That's not the lazy part, right? That's, but that's so all the lazy part, right? So by composing these operations, you are you're just describing uh, the task graph, like you said, uh, and and um, uh, separating it entirely from the execution of that of that graph. Uh, and yeah, that that part can be totally uh, const expert. I actually think that's a great point, which is if this whole library can be const expert, except the execution part, then that's a good test of how that works. If and I'm not sure. If that, that basically means everything that we are talking about can be expressed in compile time and execution will only be done later. Yes, and that's absolutely that's absolutely true. Um, it, it is entirely but that part of it um, that is cleanly separated from execution can be done at compile time. Okay. Yeah. This kind of leads me in to the fact that you know. Um, we haven't really talked about parallelism at all. You know, we mentioned a little bit in the beginning, but so far we've only been talking about concurrency, like launching threads and doing things like that. Um, so getting back to the discussion about um, task graphs and lazily constructing task graphs, lazily executing them, um, I talked about this earlier. Um, the parallel algorithms are fast because they communicate the full structure of a task graph in order to the um, uh, to the algorithm so that the scheduler can make intelligent decisions. Um, uh, and, and what I wanted to say about that is that um, laziness is a prerequisite for parallelism. Because in order for the scheduler to have a chance to do something intelligently with a parallel description of a task graph, you can't have started executing it already. You want to give the scheduler the opportunity to make those decisions. So if you've already launched the operation, then you've taken all of the control away from the scheduler. You can't do anything intelligent anymore. And you can't unlaunch the rockets. So you need this lazy description of the task graph. That includes information about what operations can be done in parallel with what other operations. And then you need to, as a separate step, schedule this thing and mass in order for parallelism to actually happen. <clears throat> so
So now imagine that we have something like a parallel fork algorithm that creates a, a node in a graph of lazy centers. By composing these lazy centers, we build a representation of the data flow that is independent of its execution. And how that graph gets executed can be left up to the switch. So, lazy and parallel is like, this is uh, where the sweet spot is. We don't get parallelism without laziness. That's it. Um, Semi receiver has all of these really nice ones. So it permits, this is the, the one that um, is really important to me. It permits, permits generic algorithms with efficient default implementations. <laughs> all right, that's my speech. Questions? Uh, do you have any other? Is that a yeah, we'll <laughs> I, I sent Danny, but I, I, is that way to watch the new memory on the um, task graph? Mm, I don't think so. I think it needs to be the the dead. Yeah. I mean, in inside each node, you can have loops. Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if this is quite appropriate, but my father always told me that I wasn't afraid at all of hard work because I could lie down and go to sleep right next to it. <laughs> I think that fits right in with your <laughs> presentation. Excellent. I like your father. <laughs> is there a link right after whatever that you guys have done for the I think I have some references here. Um, yeah. <laughs> We'll put these on the slides that we'll put on the... Uh, and unfortunately, this is, I, I grabbed the wrong version of this slide. I'm going to write something on the board. Because um, uh, just maybe like a week or two ago, we published some um, experimental code. Uh, and it's uh, uh, GitHub, of course. Um, and I think it's... Uh, Facebook experimental and it's called lib unifix for like unified executives and so this uh, is where we are um, um, evolving these these ideas in a C++ library that, that you can start using um, it's pretty bare bones right now. Um, which version of C++ do you need? I think this is uh, C++ 17 and later, I think. Yeah, yeah I don't okay. Like it. uh, generic lambda. Generic lambda, yeah. yeah. Do you not really use concepts? This does not use concepts. Okay. Yeah. Or, or this uh, does use coroutines, but with Clang you can uh, s send a, a turn coroutines on with a compiler switch. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and uh, this doesn't need coroutines. There's an awful lot of what I showed here that doesn't use coroutines at all. Right. But if you have coroutines, then it turns on that part of the library. I'm wondering if it's something that has to well, probably, probably latest. I don't know. We haven't tried compiling MSVC. What compiles support the code? MSVC supports code routines, um, but they aren't up to the latest draft standard. So they don't do symmetric transfer, for instance, that guaranteed tail call, the, the jumps instead of the function calls. Doesn't do that. Um, there's a couple of other things that it doesn't do yet. Um, Clang, if you're interested in using coroutines, Clang is your best bet right now. Mm -hmm. And get like the most recent version of Clang that you possibly can because their implementation has been flaky and they've shaken out a lot of the bugs. Still a couple of code gen issues. But 
by and large, you're not likely to hit. Mostly, yeah. Thank you very much.